A highlight of the ninth annual conference was the lunchtime opportunities for farmers to tell their stories about why they farm, what is good about farming, and to describe the challenges to farming in the United States. Their stories are the strength behind this conference. How's everybody doing? Okay, I have so many stories, but the one that I'll tell is the one about uh, the children. Uh, I've been in farming, well, I grew up on a farm in uh, Fresno, California, but my farming experience as far as growing food for farmers market in the community started uh, four years ago. And what prompted me was uh, my daughter uh, with the with my, with the food movement in North Minneapolis. Um, the health issues, the lack of quality food. and just the lack of organization to improve conditions. When I got into it, I didn't have uh, a lot of understanding. And there's a lot of people who helped me. And uh, last year, I mean, the first year, I volunteered a lot, and I volunteered at gardens. And I got a lot of support from uh, different organizations and my business partner. She taught me a lot. And uh, so two years ago, I became a... Uh, the coordinator for a community garden. And um, I noticed uh, it was a lot of children in the community. Children of color. And so those became my farmers. And around this same time, that's when uh, Project Sweetie Pie was developing a program for youth to farm. And so we've been doing that for the past two years with good success. And last year, uh, yeah, last year I had a Hmong farmers to join us. And I thought that was a breakthrough because of the communications and uh, the things we think of each other. So that was really helpful for me. They taught me a lot about growing food and how to get a better yield. And it, uh, it improved relationships in the community for the kids too. The good thing about food that it brings people together And I just want to back up a minute. Uh, three years ago, I learned about the farmer's market uh, through Community Table. And I met a lot of Hmong farmers. I learned a lot about putting the products together to make them more attractive. And then two years ago, we uh, worked together, me and some Hmong ladies, to process the food. 
because there were such large quantities and they had the right person when they picked me because I hate to throw anything away. <laughs> so we processed thousands of pounds of food for ourselves and for others. And, and we'd like to expand that market. And so over the last four years, I've learned to grow. I've learned to market. I've learned to educate. And I've taught youth how to make money. And for myself, a lot of people think that uh, well, we don't make a lot of money. Me, me and uh, Bev, we put in a lot of hours, but we don't, make, we don't make money. The kids make money and they learn. Thank you. I grew up in Laos and came here when I'm a lot older, so I don't have the abilities to go learn. So I came to this country with a lot of kids. My husband back in Laos was uh, hurt in the war. And so when, he, when we came here in this country, he wasn't able to work. So I have no choice but to go and farm. When my kids were a lot younger, I stayed home, prepared them to go to school, and now my kids are a lot bigger. So now I thought of farming on one acre land so that I could have enough for me and my family. After that, all my kids are off at school, and so I thought that I could do more. So I've farmed on a three to four acre land for three years. So then I started selling my produce at the farmer's market. So I realized if I was to just, to just stay home, then I would feel really depressed. I have the ability to just talk with different races of people, and I find it a way to uh, feel less depressed. This is just for the elderly like me, because they don't know how to speak another language or don't have the education, and not for the young. Thank you. I come to this country in 2004. I, um, I get a factory job making uh, horseshoes for, for the last 10 years. Uh, I, I start thinking on doing farming on this country just for just because uh, at the first at the first time when I going to a Mexican grocery store, I see the quality of the produce there, and uh, for the Mexican culture we have uh, some kind of herbs, and sometimes it's very hard to find right here in Minnesota. So I was talking with my brother, Carlos, about the quality. We, we, we say, oh, do you see the quality of, of this? And he said, yes. And we start thinking on get some land so we can grow your, our own um, produce for our dishes. So we start asking 
for our with our neighbors too if if somebody is allowed to us to use uh, their land this is very hard so i i is i i i going to uh, a tax office to talking with a lady on St. Paul. And I, I just started talking with her about uh, get a house uh, to uh, pay my taxes and that few other stuff. And she, I, I, we started talking about the farming and she told me like, do you, you are, you was a farmer in Mexico? I say, yes, I can. She told me it's one organization, it's a Minnesota Food Association. And she told me, why you not talk with them and get some land? And uh, when I go there, uh, they, they told me we can rent some land, but the, the only thing is you need to follow uh, organic uh, rules or organic methods and uh, at the first I never heard that about the term or organic was a new concept for me so that's at that time was a uh, 2000 2005 when I start thinking uh, to get the, the land they asked me if I have credit and it was funny because I, I say for, for what? Yes, because you need to get a loan. Even when I start build, building my credit, I, I get a computer because I don't have the skills to use a computer. So when I start to doing uh, my credit, I get a computer first. Then my next thing what I get was a, a, a small tractor, 24 horsepower tractor, and then the next thing I get are uh, high tunnels. And then the next thing what I get with my credit was my farm. So from the beginning, take for me five years to get my, my farm. Uh, I have a few customers. One of the customers is like uh, the Chipotle Mexican restaurant is a change of restaurants. I sold uh, bell peppers. And um, soon, I think, uh, if they give me a good price, I'm going to start selling onions. But I don't know, maybe. Um, I have another customers like uh, co-partners. It's a, a distribution center for organic crops. So it's, it's in St. Paul. I'm gonna tell you about the list of my crops. I have four main crops. I have uh, bell peppers, broccoli, to heirloom tomatoes, and garlic. Uh, two years ago, I tried, three years ago, I tried to do in my own CSA, but it uh, was a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I tried to have a full-time job, plus try to grow a commercial size uh, produce, and then I try to do a CSA to grow in 50 or 60 different crops. It's crazy. <laughs> From the beginning, I think it's going to be a hobby uh, when my business starts growing. Uh, right now, I, I have uh, new opportunities. I have a lot of challenges for my life. I start helping new farmers, and uh, every day, every day is, is coming more opportunities to me, to my farm, to my brother. So uh, I want to show the new farmers when I have a good ideas and a bad ideas. I want to, I want to spur them. They can see how hard, how risky, how sometimes how dangerous is a farm, a farm uh, job. So uh, I am still learning. When some people ask me questions sometimes, I don't know. Sometimes I, I don't know what I say. But I am feel so happy doing farming. 
I am, I love this. This is my passion. So, so thank you. Thank you. North Minneapolis is going green. Give us a call and learn what we mean. Where once lie urban blight, now sits luscious garden sites, gardens without borders, classrooms without walls, architects of our own destinies, access to food, justice for all. Uh, my name is Michael Cheney. I'm an artist, poet, uh, farmer, organizer. Uh, three years ago, when North High was threatened to be closed, myself, uh, Sam Grant, Kali Graddick, and a bunch of folks, we made a commitment that to kill a school was to kill a heart of a community, and we weren't interested in that happening in North Minneapolis. So we formed a program called Project Sweetie Pie, and the first year we had five gardens, we had uh, 50 partners. Second year, we had 10 gardens, we had 75 partners. Uh, this past summer, we did 25 gardens, we had 135 partners. We had folks from Burpee Seeds gave us uh, over 10,000 packs of seeds that I gave away to people like they were candy. And uh, we frame it in the reference that we hear all this rhetoric that it takes a village to raise a child. Let's do a national demonstration model. What would that look like if we were all committed to the future development of our children and providing them a pathway to success? And so we join forces, and, and typically in America, you know, it's every man, woman, dog for himself. But we decided that we were going to collaborate and, and convene and work together to make a better, stronger community. And so one of the projects that we're doing now that I, the reason I wanted to speak to you all is two years ago I went to the Council on Black Minnesotans, and which is an ombudsman group. You know, they've got an Asian Pacific Council, they've got a Latino Council. And so this year, we're going to be uh, putting forth some legislation before this upcoming session. And if we're successful, we've got Karen Clark, who is a state representative. And we are, we're calling that in populations where there's 60,000 people or more, that land would be set aside for urban farmers. Because none of us will grow in this room unless we have access to land. We also are asking that, just like the Department of Natural Resources gets money every year from our tax dollars, we're asking that money be set aside for urban farm pilot projects and another revenue stream so that we can fuel each and every one of you and help you realize your own personal and your collective dreams. So at the end of uh, February, we're going to be putting, uh, going to the Capitol and we're going to be meeting be with the state legislators there and try to get them to set aside land for urban farming. At the turn of the century in Minneapolis, uh, there were those pioneers there who felt that a park system was a valuable asset for future generations to come. And so those wise visionaries put together the park system, which is now the pride and joy in America. You know, it's a park system that everybody looks to when they talk about park system. They look at Minneapolis and the park system that those people 100 some years ago put in place. So we're hoping that our, our activism that we're trying to set across urban farming land for each and every one of you, we'd ask you to come join with us. We'd ask that we uh, get the state legislators to help support us in our efforts to grow food for ourselves, for our families, and for generations still to come. Thank you. My name is David Joshua. I'm originally from Liberia, West Africa. My story is not too long after I graduated from high school deciding to go to college. I spent a year with my dad on the farm. And as a young man coming up, uh, he had a pickup and I learned to drive. And you can imagine a young man, your dad entrusts you with a car. I mean, you, you, you acquire a lot of fame you know, and prestige in the community. But uh, that wasn't all to it. He entrusted me with a farm. Uh, most of the time, I used to do the selling. 
when you say sell this chicken for a dollar, I will add sometimes 25 cents and then sell it a dollar and 25. <laughs> and at the end of the day, multiply that by the total number that I sold and take out all his dollars and the remaining ones I will put them in my pocket. And when I put it in my pocket, uh, invite some friends, and I mean, I just offer people anything. And that way, you know, all the young girls in the town, and all, the, all your peers, you know, you command a lot of respect from them. So I made a lot of money from there, because we were raising uh, chicken, and we were raising a uh, hog. So I made a lot of money, and then I said, ah, I see. But I think I can be a farmer. Yeah, it has a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And besides that, we have a lot of money. You can have a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> to really succeed in this work, you have to put your mind, body, and soul in it. And to do that, you must uh, commit all your, com I mean, you, you should commit all your time. But with the kind of economy we have here, uh, you got some bills and things to pay. Now, wh where do you, what do you do to, how do you continue to pay your bills and try to be successful on the other end? Because I was doing this work, I had seen that going to my job. And farming, everyone in here who knows about farming, it requires full time. You have to be there to be able to observe your crops. You must know them, and they will be able to know you. But if you don't have enough time to do that, it will be difficult. So this is where I am. That's why I said I was kind of hesitant. But maybe if I share this, um, I might have somebody to talk to to see. What do you hold on to before you can really be fully engaged with uh, this your new idea? Thank you. So right now, I wanted to tell a little story. Um, I just wanted to apologize, first of all, to the elders. If I have offended you, or if I, am, if I offend you, please um, forgive me. So in the past, I um, was not a farmer. I did not sell the pro uh, products that I um, grew. I only had a quarter of a farm. My mom is someone who was a farmer who sold her produce. My mom, um, I've helped her many times at her farm. Um, she is a person who, when she farms, grows her stuff, they're, uh, they're all not lined up perfectly. They're all actually intersecting with each other, um, growing here and there. I asked her to please grow her veggies in a straight line. She would then uh, string a line across and try to... Uh, make it straight, but then she would make them really short, and so. So we told her, Mom, if you're just going to farm like that, we don't know how to help you anymore. And Mom said, um, Son, why do you say that? I farm for 30 years. I know more than you do. So then I started thinking, and I also went and helped her too, and then I started doing farming um, to sell my produce. Um, I did three acres of land. And my mom had one acre. 
So I um, worked on my farm. I also helped mom on hers. And, um, you know, mom, she planted her stuff not in uh, straight lines. They were all intersecting with each other. So when I uh, went and I used a tiller, I would, uh, there wouldn't be space to till the ground. And sometimes I would kill her produce because there was no way to till. She grew every kind of vegetable out there that she knew of, um, you know, but pumpkins, uh, cucumbers, everything that was green all over her farm. Sometimes she would come to my farm and even say, oh, your, your, um, guard, your farm just looks so plain and bare, like there's nothing growing. I don't have any hope for you at all. <laughs> and then for mom, she would pick her stuff, but uh, uh, pick out her stuff, but then they would grow old and then there would be weeds and then she would be unable to, you know, take out the weed as fast as, as they grew. So what she would do is sit and cry. And then people would ask her about her farm, and she would say, no, nah, it's not mine, it's his. ก็ยาดันนั่งสอเลยนอแต่ชิกูมั่วเป้ยาอยู่หาดอเป้ยาที่อีสุเลยอ่ะวิริจากูเราเต้ยาที่อ้อยอ่ะอ้วเต้ป
Because One thing I see is because if we farm, we we don't get money. That's why we don't go help our mom and dad over the farms. So because um, whatever we tell our mom and dad, they don't listen to us and uh, they don't know how to grow their food and when they go to sell at the farmer's market, they sell for really cheap. And when I total it out uh, for the entire time of farming, we only get paid 10 cents or less per hour. So even if you, if you think of it that way, no matter if you farm, you will not get any money. Okay. <laughs> For good example, back to Thailand. I just wanted to give an example. Like back in Thailand, um, we go help mom and dad them at the farm, but we don't get any money. So we decide to go work instead at a farm. Um, they would say, they would tell us that we're lazy because we don't want to go farm, but then they would see us over at a different farm helping them out. And they said, you're lazy to help me, but why are you helping them over there? We said, oh, we're just there for fun. We're just helping them for the fun of it, but they don't know that we're getting paid for it. <laughs> and even, they, we also get candy too. So, yeah. uh, um, and also, uh, the second thing is that people look at farmers um, as low, like low... Up, low um, that career. It's a low occupation. Yeah. So, so if people see you, they would be like, oh, that, that guy, he's just a farmer. He doesn't have money. And if they have girls, daughters, they don't want the daughters to marry us. <laughs> So back, uh, history. And this is what they tell us. I mean, the parents would say, you have to be a, um, go to school, get an education, become a doctor or a lawyer. That's the best for you. So that is why there's no young, younger people who uh, farm at all. Um, and then one last thing here is just want to tell you why I was interested in becoming a farmer. So for me, the first thing is that um, I like to eat um, clean, healthy food. I like to keep myself healthy, and I like to eat food that does not have any chemicals in them. Even if I'm not a farmer, I'm going to grow my own produce in my backyard. Okay. So, and also the second reason why I wanted to become a farmer is because I can learn from them and I can also teach them how to become a farmer and how to make profit from farming. And also the third thing is that, you know, the younger generation, they don't like to farm. So once our older, the elders are past, who's going to be growing our food? Farming is within our culture. We need to keep it going. The last thing is that I want to um, try and build a business. Yeah. And also, if I do farm, I do think I'll have more time to spend with my family. I feel that a lot of uh, families have been broken because they don't have enough time together. Yeah. So, um, I also see that back in our country, we were really poor. So, our king told us to um, grow our own produce so that we don't have to take our own money out of our own pockets to go buy others. So because I see that as a good idea, I, I want to use that idea. Yeah. Even, uh, 
even in America, I still use that. And I also see that in our country, sometimes uh, it's a really dry season where we don't have any water. But um, our um, king above, he um, makes some rain to help with our um, food down here. So, so I also um, am glad that Obama they have this um, idea to help the farmers. That's great too. Because I do see that some some years we do have uh, dry seasons where all our produ- uh, products die. Yeah. Yeah. The, and that's that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, like Lee said, oh, I am, or we are, just five of us, Karen, K-A-R-E-N, like a girl's name, but pronounced Karen. We are not Burmese. We come from Burma. Um, and we've been, uh, I would say, refugees because the Burmese are wanting to take over our land where we are uh, farmers. Uh, that is uh, the, the way of life for our Karen people. <clears throat> um, of course, the United States is foreign to us, but for me, farming is even more foreign than the United States is, uh, because 50 years ago, I graduated from an engineering school, and we, I started out as an EIT, which is engineering training. Um, for, 50, for 40 years, I was in that profession. But 10 years ago, I took early retirement to assist my Karen people that has not seen the better days of life. Uh, but three years ago, I, I graduated from EIT to FIT, farmer in training. <laughs> uh, it was all... Uh, I. I it really is um, the synchronicity of things in my life is wonderful. I did not plan to be a farmer. In fact, um, it was the invitation of the Karen refugees in Akron after they heard that I had come back from the refugee camp to come assist them. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time because the city of Akron was wanting to develop urban community gardens. So in 2009, they started this Let's, uh, Akron, uh, Akron Grows, and it was very, supported, very much supported by the city of Akron. And later on, I got hooked into Let's Grow Akron, another uh, community garden project that the city had. And that's when I was able to connect with the Karens to find them some land to grow uh, gardens. And then for some another reason, uh, I got the good fortune to hook up with Asia Services. And then Asia Services has these garden projects. In fact, uh, because of that project, we are able to bring come here. And also the good fortune that I have bought a property there and then I started, so that's when I got my hand dirty. I didn't want to dirty my hand before, but now, <laughs> but, but the dirt was wonderful. The first spade that I put in my ground in the property that I bought brought up wrigglers, you know, oh, deep, foamy soil. And through the friends of uh, American friends, as well as Asian friends, I was very fortunate again, they brought all the starters for me. So I had it easy. And, but... The Asian vegetables like roselle and uh, uh, hot Asian peppers. And then we had these meat along beans that we grew. And Pari Oke was instrumental in helping me get that garden going. And I was able to find uh, property that another community organization donated. So we were, it was on Wall Street. So we got to occupy Wall Street there. <laughs> And there we had an acre, uh, area of about, what, 30 feet wide by 80 feet long that we started. 
and it was the pride and joy of the community. And we introduced uh, Asian vegetables to uh, the Americans, and they really liked, especially the uh, tendrils from pumpkins, we, uh, pumpkin, pum, from Asian pumpkins. And Asian pumpkins are very different than the squash-like pumpkins, uh, American pumpkins. It's very uh, uh, meaty and also has a texture of sweet, uh, sweet potatoes. So that's another thing that we uh, taught the Americans to utilize these shoots that come out of the tendrils that come out of, and they've made a salad out of that, and they really enjoy that. Of course, the meat along beans was something new to them. Um, so anyway, IBH, which is Interval Brotherhood Homes, uh, run by a Catholic institution, heard about the good work that the Koreans have been doing and the diligence that they put f into their efforts. So they in invited us to come talk to them. They op were operating 46 acres of land, but they had leased it out to a monocropper, GMO y y use, and, but they wanted to get away from that, and they, ha they are taking 20 acres away from them, and they want to make it into a sustainable garden there. And of course, our Karens were invited, and they're going to start out slow. Of that 20 acres, they're going to allot four acres to our Karen people and three acres for their uh, residents. You know, it's an alcohol rehabilitation program, and they wanted them to have some training in growing sustainable food. And Putty OK will be responsible for teaching them how to grow sustainable gardening. I myself, like I said, I'm I'll always be a fit person. <laughs> Um, because I've always been in training because I have so much to learn. And coming here, thanks to Asia Services, we were able to come this, uh, like I said, second time, and we were taking back the information to share with our people. And so uh, we, we hope 2014 will be a fantastic year for us because this is the largest acreage that we will be starting to have. And Pari Oki's hope is that one day we'll have uh, a big farm with our own com with our own hoop houses, uh, high tunnels, and then we will be uh, we will. Right now, he has to work. You know, he 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 works from two in the afternoon till twelve at night, and in the early mornings he goes to the gardens and works. He ha um, he works about three gardens, and he is such a encouragement to all of us Karens, and hopefully we'll have more Karens participate in such a program. And we're thinking of later on getting a 12-acre farm, which we are exploring the finances, and uh, introduce Asian vegetables. He has already found a market, actually, because every he doesn't even have to go out and have a stand. People are waiting for him when he comes back from his field. And not only is Pari OK in vegetable gardening, he's also into aquaponics. We'll be raising frig, uh, we'll be raising frogs, and and as well as mushrooms, as well as uh, tilapia. So this is the project that we hope, and uh, all this information. I, I, I'm I'm merely a conduit. Actually, I'm a catalyst. I don't change, but I help assist in the changes that our people will have in this country. Thank you. I believe when I hold a seed in my hand or plant a seed into the soil, I am holding or planting dreams, like somehow every seed contains in it a dream for a plant, a dream that will feed people and earth, a dream that will build a stronger world and community. My name is Regina LaRoche. I live and 
have a micro farm called Diaspora Gardens in northern Wisconsin on the south shore of Lake Superior. And I am here because of so many gifts. There is the gift of my father who was born and raised in Haiti, Haiti, in the West Indies. And his family was a strong family. They were preachers and journalists and politicians, but always they were farmers. Even when they lived in the city, they grew their own food. My father, in the late, mid and late 50s, ended up in a deep political trouble that threatened his life with the president for life in Haiti, Papa Doc. And he was arrested a number of times and tortured. And finally, he was snuck, smuggled out of the country to North America. And when he got here, he had to do what many of the people in this room had to do. He had to learn a new language. He had to learn a new way to live and a new way to deal with the world. And as a small child, as I grew and watched him and watched him yearn for his home, for his tropical island, for his parents and his brothers and sisters. The times where I saw him most at peace was when he was growing food and watering flowers. And he always took me and the other children in our family to visit farms. And that went deep in my heart. My mother grew up sharecropping in South Carolina. And that, the first farmer that they know of in her family was her grandfather, Addison Bryson. And then his daughter farmed, and the man she married farmed. And then my mother and her seven siblings also farmed. But at that time, the system of sharecropping was very hard, and it was hard to make a living. And there were some of the same things that we just heard about. And they all decided to move up north to the land of milk and honey, Minnesota. <laughs> and when they got here, all of the children found different jobs and different ways to make a living. And some of them stayed as far away from the soil and the gardens and the plants as they could. But some of them are always sneaking little seeds and plants into their home and into their life. And always I was hearing stories of the pigs and the neighbors and the cotton and the boll weevil. <laughs> and so when I was a young child, my parents, the farmer from Haiti, the farmer from South Carolina, moved us out to a small farm just north of the Twin Cities, north of St. Paul. And I grew up on a small farm where most of the food that we ate for much of the year came from the land there. Then I moved to the city with big dreams and big plans. I was going to be a city girl in New York and get around the world. But as a small child, I had gone to Haiti twice, once with my father's brother and his family. Before my father had become an American citizen, it was not safe for him to go back to Haiti. But then to see his aging parents, he became a citizen so that he would have the protection of the United States government. And then he took me back again. So what I saw there, what I learned there, also entered my heart. About 14 years ago, I moved from St. Paul with my husband and two small boys to Madeline Island on the south shore of Lake Superior with all of those things in my heart and with the same kinds of dreams that can grow out of all kinds of seeds. When I got there, I began to plant the soil so I would feed my family. Shortly after moving there, I traveled to South Africa and learned from some people there and saw the work that they were doing to try to help people grow their own food whose soil and the drought in their villages had them starving. And I was introduced to a principle called permaculture, 
When I returned home with that also in my heart, I began to build my gardens differently and began to use that simple way of growing. My home is also very simple. We heat with firewood. We heat with, we haul our water into our home and pump it. We live in a small community. In the winter, there's 250 of us. And many are very, very poor. And it costs a lot to take a boat over the water to go buy your food. So I soon found myself in a group of people who were trying to figure out how to take care of our community and to grow food so that people of all incomes and ages would have enough to eat and to be strong and be healthy. I love stories. I love song. I love dance. And as I studied those things, one of the things I discovered is that with most creatures, with most living things on this earth, with most cultures, all of who we are as human beings grows out of how we gather, collect, grow, and share our food. So as my dream began to grow into diaspora gardens, remembering my dad's yearning for home, remembering how he got closer to home when he grew his food carefully from the earth, I created this diaspora gardens, and it's a place on this great lake, and I often say, because my father's from an island, there's part of my heart that needed to go to an island, and I just turned the wrong way and went north, and I went to a cold island. <laughs> but there, I've studied the soil. I'm still learning. I've studied the people. I'm still learning. And we've begun to build this micro farm, this very small scale farm, to nourish bodies, to nourish the earth, to nourish spirit, to nourish love of learning, to nourish community. And I started with the bigger dream. We bought a bigger plot of land. It still would have been a very small farm, 30 acres altogether. And then we ran into the hardships that many people did. It was hard to pay the taxes. It was hard to make the land payments. So in the, in the middle of a farm beginning program that I was in for one year, we had to sell that land. And I was heartbroken. I thought my dream was over. And then we looked where we were living. We had a simple homestead on six acres of land, much of which was woodland. And we thought about the things that were most important to us. What I'd been inspired by in Haiti and in South Africa and living in the Twin Cities. And I realized that a lot of what I wanted to do with this dream of diaspora gardens was to model a very simple way that almost anyone or any community, even with very little money and technology, could grow food. So we thought, this is a gift, being small, being simple. And so that is what we do. And we invite children, we invite adults, young adults, to come and experience that. We have um, young adult interns who live with us for a short period of time and assist. We have young people come and help us build very simple tunnels and plant things. We have small children come and help with harvest. We offer a small number of shares where every week members of our community receive food. And one of the aims of that is to believe that we're forging connections between the people in the community, between the people and their food and the earth. We also believe in connections. Food, our need for food, for soil, for rain, for community as a universal that somehow means for me if I dig deeply into the soil, I'm digging deeply into something that connects me to everyone else. So it was with great delight. My, la my two boys no longer live at home. The youngest one is in his second year of college. And I was shocked this winter break when he announced that when he had told the students at school, how we lived and how we grew our food, 10 of them wanted to come home with them. 
and they did. <laughs> and, and what was lovely and also unfortunate in some ways, eight of them were from Korea, South Korea. One was from Brazil, and then the other was American, North American. And so that is part of the vision, part of the dream of connecting with young people, connecting with people of all ages and people all over this globe with something that is a dream for all. So I give you thanks. I give thanks to my family and the cultures that have taught me. I give thanks to the people who have been teaching us here, our presenters, our organizers, to each other. I have learned so much from just listening to you all talk. I give thanks for people who plant the dreams. And I give thanks to those who let us talk to one another, our interpreters. Thank you. OK. Thank you to everyone for sharing your stories. Um, I think we all leave enriched when we learn about people. Um, we all come from different places. And uh, what we learn through sharing of stories is that we have so much more that unites us than we have that divides us. So I personally take a lot of hope and inspiration from these stories. I hope that, uh, that you all do too. And we're ready to move on to the next part of the conference. Mm -hmm.